basis of your thinking is determined by the first images you see, whose values are important and whose stories are important. And that's what we're teaching little girls and little boys. The power of what you see in childhood really gets into the DNA of what becomes possible for you growing up. Media has the power to educate, to shape people's thoughts. It also has an incredible power when you get to see someone who's like you on screen. The images that all of us see influence how we treat each other and how policy is formed and how ideas are built. Filmmaking has told us no. Women shouldn't be focused on or learned about their desires, their wants, their needs, their fears. We're not just shaping the perspectives in this country, we're shaping perspectives around the world. We've had such a tiny slice of what's evocative to the world on the screen. Eighty percent of the media consumed worldwide is created in the United States. We are responsible for exporting a pretty negative view of women. You play ball like a girl. Most of television and most of film is men making stuff for other men. Women are virtually excluded from the directing profession. We are disappeared. We have to all decide together that it's enough. The door has to be open. We just want inclusion. Remember the kids' books in the 50s, see Dick, see Jane? And I just felt like, you know, we see Dick all the time. <laughs> and I just wanted to see more Jane. When I was a teen, my parents subscribed to Reader's Digest, and I remember reading some article about why feminists are ruining the world. I didn't know what a feminist was, but I said, whatever that is, I'm sure I don't want to be that because they're ruining the world. Oh, did you feel the breeze from the Segway? I was obsessed with becoming a movie star. I watch TV a lot. Hi, Ginger. Hi, Gilligan. So I'm thinking, Ginger, movie star. In Hollywood, I've been chased by the best. My first job, Lynn Stallmaster's office called model agencies. The character had to look good in their underwear. I had been in Victoria's Secret catalog, <laughs> airbrushed, perfectly lit. They were like, let's get her. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Oh, that's, oh, oh Jesus. So the very first thing I shot was in my underwear with Dustin. I have to kiss Dr. Brewster. Oh, uh, yeah, he kisses all the women on the show. We call him the tongue. Movies and television have always driven me insane. The misogyny is, is just so, it's almost unremarkable. Back when I was doing music videos, I just saw that women were absolutely inconsequential as anything other than ornamentation. I was learning to just shut up and get the job done. Just driving home one night, I just kind of saw the whole thing in one flash. And I had never written anything before. Of all the movies I did, Thumb and Louise changed the course of my life. Well, darling, look out, because my hair is coming down. All right. All of us were my. stunned. The movie had the kind of impact that it did. <laughs> you are disturbed. Yeah, I believe I am. The reaction that it got from women, it was completely different. You gonna apologize or what? They'd say things like, my friend and I acted out your trip. And I'd be like, what part? When they blow up that truck, it's just like, oh, you get such a rush. There was something, I think, freeing in every woman that watched it. It showed me, like, wow, you can have power as a woman and not have to be in completely of service and submitting 1,000%. My husband wasn't sweet to me. Look how I turned out. So the usual seeing women Shit. as complicated, able to make mistakes, able to be funny and sexual and troubled. 
I had been awakened to how women are portrayed in the media. I realized we give them so few opportunities to feel inspired by the female characters. The next movie was League of Their Own. Now it was girls coming up and saying, you know, I play sports because of that movie. I can't do that. Who can? League of Their Own was a very influential movie for me as a kid. It was one of the first movies that really affected me. I watched it every day for a whole summer. I hadn't thought about the girls in the audience before. I realized we need to make sure girls can see female characters doing things. We don't have enough real life role models. Okay, I gotta get tough with you guys. We all grew up where it was perfectly okay to have TV shows that had no female characters. Well, Precinct Yamana. If there is a female character, they're usually the one with like a group of males. Whereas the male characters, they might have four or five lead characters. We want something else! So that you could have the one who is this, and the one who is this, and the funny one, and the smart one. I'm the brains, you're the looks, Charlie's the wild card, and Frank is the muscle. Well, what's D? She's the useless chick. Oh! Guys get to see themselves, get to become a writer, get to become an astronaut. And women get to be a girlfriend that gets ditched. <laughs> Is everything OK, baby? Mostly we're being saved. You have a knack for getting in trouble. <laughs> you have a knack for saving my life. The woman in the story has to be like the most beautiful woman so that the man is attracted to her. What's wrong, Daddy? Mm, baby. The reason we have much less complexity it very much reflects on what's the point of view that you take to a film. How do you write women so well? I think of a man, and I take away reason and accountability. White, straight men who come from a certain class background have had their hands on the narrative for as long as this country has been around. Our anger, our frustration, our rage is the thing that stories have been told about for generations and generations. All the way back into the 1800s, you've had a type of American hero, which I would say is the same as the American anti-hero. Now and you stay out of this, all of you. I don't want you with me. It's the Western myth extrapolated into any story. There is one man, usually middle-aged. He's a veteran, retired gunslinger. They need to pick up their guns again to eliminate any challenge to their manhood. This concept is inherently sexist because the women are in orbit around the men. It looks so good. As a writer, I've been in many situations where like a studio calls me and says, we want you to do like a couple days of a pass on a movie with the female characters. I'm like, guys, that's not how it works. Bringing in a female writer to like punch up the girlfriend character, that isn't enough. I call that spackling. And I have come to realize that my job is really just to show up and spackle those cracks in. Early in my career, I would take the, the girlfriend role and say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fuck this up and turn this inside out like a leech on a barbed wire and try and make something different out of it. Nine times out of 10, I'm gonna give you something so multidimensional because I know what I'm bringing in is much deeper than the words they put on that page. Please, oh, come on now. What am I feeling? I'm not taking him with me. In Kramer versus Kramer, I was representing a woman who had left a child because she was undergoing psychological problems. The writer and the director and my co-star all were putting their heads to what would she say? What would she say? What could she possibly say? Okay, look, I don't want to get into this. Look, okay. you're going to have to do what you're going to have to do, and I'm going to have to do what I'm doing. I'm very doing. sorry about this. We all went into our rooms. Each of us wrote our version of how she would defend this decision. And it was easy for me to, to write that because I, I could empathize. I had to believe that it was the only thing I could do. 
and that it was the best thing for him. I was incapable of functioning in that home. But where the story was located... How's it feel? ...was in the head and in the heart of its male protagonist. And what she thought was, you know, well, we'll ask the actress. <laughs> Imagine you're a woman in the theater. In this movie that even though there are 50% of you occupy the world, this movie's not made for you. One of the reasons I don't watch a lot of films of mine is because you see yourself through the eyes of the male camera operator, and you see yourself through the eyes of the male director. When I think I'm acting, it's really panning across my ass. Weather advisory, if you're gonna go outside, bring a paddle. I don't know what my life would have been like if you guys hadn't moved here. I came out to LA, and I met a woman agent who said to me, this business is about tits and ass, which you have neither of. Imagine, as a man, people really wanting to, to look at your body when they see you, and look at your clothes, and look at your hair and your eyes. Just the thought exercise of going through your whole life knowing that the way your body is shaped matters more to the world than what you're thinking about. We definitely internalize the representations of women on screen when we're young girls. It's important, first and foremost, to have men see you in a certain way. I definitely felt from a very young age that you're being, like, turned into an object, as opposed to how do I look at the world? What do you desire? What do you want? That's the big, like, mental shift that I wish I had when I was a kid. I created my own production company, Freckle Films, and the one thing I've realized that I'm eliminating is the description of female characters. Dr. Jones, 35, bitchy. She's pretty, but she's know it, or she's like slightly over the hill. When you are working with writers of a lesser ability, of the lesser intelligence, actually, then they're gonna define women by their hair color. Here I go again, feisty, sexy, um, hot, like hot-tempered. We have been otherized by men, really to be able to allow men to give birth to their own subjectivity. It's a system and a structure that has long stacked the odds against us. So we've been written out of a lot of spaces. Growing up, I never saw anyone that like represented me or looked like me or, wow, I want to be like her. This is a day in the life for the people. When I tried to get an agent, they didn't know where to place me. They're like, okay, you're Latina, but um, you don't look Mexican. And I'm like, I'm not, though. Give me my change. Get the food. After I did Baby Boy, every role I got was hood. This girl. <laughs> I'm a trained actress. And here I am getting offered ghetto roles. <laughs> like, whatever, OK. So I never judged it. But I wasn't going to stereotype myself and continue to take those roles. And yes, I had to work, but I had to be strategic because I saw a bigger picture for myself. Ninety percent of the content that I would digest through media puts me as a sidekick or as the girl next door because of the color of my skin or my sex. I felt for a while I had to fit myself to some sort of conception of what it meant to be a black woman instead of realizing that there is so much diversity within that identity. You don't drop these macho attitudes, you are never gonna have anybody bringing you anything, anywhere, any place, anytime, ever. Cosby and the Jeffersons no, was like the only ones where they was doing all right in life. Good time, you, you know, good times, they suffering. Carla, I don't wanna live that life. What's happening? They were struggling. Dang, it's all, is it all bad? And then I remember watching Dynasty, and a black woman shows up, and it's Diane Carroll. Alexis, what do you want? This is the first time I see a black woman with money, wearing diamonds. She's having conversations with white women like she not even black. Retract this, or I'll cram it down your throat. Please. She slapped this white woman so hard. And they was wrestling. And I was like, what? 
and she didn't even go to jail. That's when I started thinking, oh, I could be anything. The Joy Luck Club was the first time I saw myself and my mother on screen. You don't know the power you have over me. It impacted me so deeply emotionally, way beyond what the content of the film was. Four years old, I get crying myself to sleep. Seeing and experiencing for the first time all that storytelling that I thought was mine was not mine. It's devastating when a little girl doesn't see herself on screen. I've been one of those little girls looking for myself. You start to believe that there's something wrong with you. It just sort of fucks with your psyche. <laughs> You're like, I think I exist. Why aren't I reflected back at what I see? There's also a shame that starts to come in. I must not be worthy to be seen or I don't feel that way, so what I'm feeling must be wrong. If we only show one perspective, it means that we don't take seriously every human being's right to understand the world from their perspective. If you imagine this as a mirror and you reflect life from this perspective, it will be real different if you put the mirror from this angle instead. There is the need for more films to come out of the voices of women and what they want and what they value and what excites them and what terrifies them and, and makes them move through the world. There is a different way to look at stories about women or stories from the point of view of a woman. Our camera placement is different because our gaze is different. You want to try to imagine narratives in which women don't need to be rescued. To try to figure out how to tell new stories. What more incredible, specific, passionate filmmaking would we be getting if all kinds of people were doing it? Like people with disabilities or people who are sexual minorities. Everybody has a nuanced experience, whether that's a young black woman who is dealing with being a part of Generation Z, being in a certain socioeconomic class, or being alive in the 21st century in which the culture that we're consuming is such an amalgamation of other cultures. Women have been paving this path, pushing up against the status quo, changing how we see ourselves so that there's an expanded idea of what you can choose and how you can have agency in your own life so that your path is not laid out by the structure that was put in place way before you got here. Imagine having that kind of protagonism as a woman. I'm the princess. Oh. I'm the example. When I had the opportunity to create Brave and the character of Merida, I purposely went for a princess just so that I could throw the princess thing on its head and not the typical. Get back! That's my mother! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Images are so powerful that it will impact real life. In 2012, my archery coach noticed that when both Brave and The Hunger Games came out, Suddenly, the percentage of girls taking up archery shot up 105% higher than adult men. After you saw CSI, after you saw female forensic pathologists on screen, and you saw the field of forensic pathology grow intensely, especially among women. She shot back. I just kept seeing again and again girls who loved this show. And it was just, it made my heart sing. And they are now half the workforce.
when half of the filmmakers and the writers are allowed in, our cultural life will change. It won't until that happens. Since I was a little kid, for me, immortality came from what you create. When I saw Lena Wertmuller's Swept Away, I thought, I can do that. The passion caught hold of me in an absolutely complete way. I wanted to be a director because I wanted to have a voice. I had a great experience in film school. There was about 50-50 male and female students. And then within a year of having graduated, I was shooting my first feature film in the UK. I came back to LA. I was signed with a huge agent at William Morris. I was tied to screenplays. I signed contracts. I was in development on feature films. And then nothing. I started watching my male peers being celebrated and beloved filmmakers. Ten <laughs> Oscar nominations. Yes. You've had a great <laughs> I didn't see that happening for any of my women friends at all. I did 265 episodes of CSI alone. I can count on one hand how many female directors we had. Out of 30 or 40 directors that I've worked with, I've probably worked with three female directors. Before Grey's, I didn't work with any female directors. I've worked with two female directors on features, and one is myself. <laughs> As an assistant director from 78 until 2006, I don't think I ever worked with a, a, a woman director. We haven't been able to imagine women as artists across the board. And in Hollywood, that reflects in the writing and directing numbers. From among the five gifted nominees tonight, the winner could be, for the first time, a woman. of women might change policy. They might change what's called great. What does good mean? Good means it resonates in the body of a man. When people are saying, I like this, they're saying, I see myself. So men are gonna feel that way when they see a myriad of male heroes. Most of the people writing the checks are men. Most of the people making distribution decisions are men. Most of the reviewers are men. I need to know that I can come and hold on to what I come from. With Daughters of the Dust, I didn't want to tell the same old story that's been told over and over again, especially about African-American women and, and our legacy. At the height of our distribution, we only had 13 prints. Among the filmmakers coming out that decade, I was pushed to the side. The curators of culture have decided that Daughters of the Dust did not fit their understanding of what an African-American film should be. In South Central the LA, local thing. it's tough to beat the streets. Because they pick and choose who they want to focus on. City. Well, this is big business. It's been shown study after study that the male-directed movies get bigger distribution, get on more screens, more advertising dollars spent, and then they get their second film easier, and then they get their third one and their fourth one. I have to admit to being radically naive. I said, well, I guess there's not sexism in Hollywood because look at me. 
Action! One of the reasons I went to film school was because of Kimberly Pierce's Boys Don't Cry. I mean, that was such an incredibly powerful film. I want to thank Kimberly Pierce for her fierce tenacity and vision. Then I got the difficulty of getting the next project. Women directors are hitting up against this ceiling at a point, at a critical point, where they could jump from smaller stuff to really big stuff. There's an assumption that men are going to have an authoritative approach and women won't have the wherewithal and the stamina to push through. What we have is a culture that says what directors should be is militant and loud and aggressive, but directing doesn't require a specific temperament. It takes every single kind of person. That's okay. we'll go again right away. I've never seen a female camera operator. We're touching them like, oh my God, you really exist. That's, something's very wrong with that. I started when I was 14 and there'd be 150 men on set and I'd be the only woman. No women in, sometimes in wardrobe, in art department, in anything. That's a lot of male energy. I've had directors who have said, you know, that I need to sit on their laps to get direction, who call me to the set, and if I won't sit on their lap, I was set back to my trailer. And I said, you know, does Tom Hanks sit on your lap? People in power for years have tried to divide and conquer actresses in order to victimize and manipulate and abuse them. To protect yourself on set is not an easy thing because you know no one else is gonna come to your aid, no one else is gonna defend you. But there is no recourse, there's no human resources department, there's nobody there. Not everybody has the safety net to say, hey, I can speak out about this and know that I can still get work in the field that I love. There's often a lot of distance between us because we're all navigating a very treacherous industry. We don't learn to call each other and lean upon each other and create community. A lot of my energy is spent on when can I ask this question? How am I going to ask for what I, what I need in order to feel safe. Part of sexism and racism is like, stay in your place, stay in your lane, shut up, like deal with, be happy with what you've got. And so we're all like siloed off. And you don't tell people what your fears are because then they know where your vulnerable spaces are. What happens to female directors is they walk into a completely male environment. And so they have to make those jokes. And so they have to do that little thing every morning, which means you cannot truly operate from, you know, your own perspective and see things through a different lens. She has to be a sort of a gymnast and a diplomat and uh, somebody's mother. I've seen female directors treated really badly, really badly. When I was 15, I did Carrie. That movie was directed by Kim Pierce, who was my first female director but it was a massively male crew. I was being talked to and treated and questioned constantly and differently. The biggest part of the movie is when she gets her period for the first time in the shower and she doesn't know that it's her period because she had never been taught that from her mother. To have these conversations with men who were saying like, well, I don't think you should depict it that way and I think you should depict it this way. And Kim and I sitting there going like, well, Respectfully, I don't think you know what you're talking about. That was just the first time where I was ever like, I guess men don't see us women equal in this industry. When you have a huge success and then your career doesn't go where it ought to go and you see the men failing upward and you're succeeding downward, don't you think that every day you wake up and say, this is my life. Maybe this isn't good enough. Maybe I should go do something where there aren't all these obstacles against me because I'm a really talented, creative human being and I love working. 
and you're stopping my right to work. I may not have the energy to do this every single day to fight this fight. It is appalling in terms of how much women's work uh, and also women's roles and women's films actually are contributing to the box office, just sheerly on a commercial level. Whenever the press announces this changes everything. I'm a little uh, skeptical. That was supposed to happen after Thumb and Louise came out. Things have changed. Everything's changed. Thelma and Louise, you went, that's it. The whole industry's going to change. Oh my God, of course, we're going to make all these female empowerment films. Didn't change anything. Ba, 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 ba. First Wives Club beat the biggest action movie. The Twilight series comes out, or Mean Girls, or Clueless. Ah, oh, as if. So you go, well, of course, this is the new paradigm. Even when I started directing, there was this sense that it was getting better. Occasionally, there's a bump, but that's not systemic change. Frozen changes everything. Hidden figures. Come on, it made so much money, and nothing. And then we go back. So I don't understand it. We need to look at the history to see what kinds of things have continued and best been perpetuated without any thought. The contrast with what it was like for women when movies were beginning is extraordinary. The silent era is full of women writing, directing, producing, owning their own companies. Film when it was born was not gender specific. They really promote the industry as a business that's really wide open to ambitious, pioneering women. There were more women directing films than is still the case. Lois Weber was one of the three great directors of early Hollywood. She was considered a peer of D.W. Griffith and Cecil B. DeMille. By 1916, Lois Weber is Universal's highest paid director. And when she forms her own independent production company in 1917, she signs a deal with Paramount, which is the most lucrative in the industry. The vast majority of the writers were female, writing in ways that played into the feminist sensibility of the period. Women were entering the workforce in greater numbers than ever before. No. Did he tell you that he loved you? No. Uh, yes, uh, of course. I yes. want you to tell me exactly what happened. When sound technology arrives, the industry is transformed. You had to shoot inside. Here are several of the big stages to take care of capacity production. You're now going to have a system. Hollywood needs financial support to invest in technology, to redo theaters. So banks invest heavily in Hollywood. Now you're linking yourself to a male moneyed hierarchy. The studios begin controlling the exhibition market. And they shout out a lot of women who had independent companies, African-American filmmakers, and they really consolidated power. They stop hiring women as directors, so women's voices are no longer valued. As soon as a job becomes really important and money-making, it suddenly becomes a man's job. The identity of a director as male or of a cinematographer as male doesn't get set until the unions really come in. Unions fought very rigorously to keep women members out. To be fair to them, what that often meant was lower pay, lower respect. The work that so many women did was erased for decades. The only woman directing for a major studio in the 1930s is Dorothy Arsner. The 
The Directors Guild of America was formed in 1936. The DGA was founded by all men. And Dorothy Arsner, she's the only female director in the DGA for well over a decade until Ida Lupino joins in the late 40s. For us to accomplish gender equity in our storytelling, we need to look at all of the various systemic mechanisms that have been holding women back. I started to do a great deal of research into the history of workplace discrimination in Hollywood. Hollywood has never had a mechanism to regulate discrimination. And Hollywood has actually always tried to maintain self-regulation. That really does open the door for all kinds of discrimination. The Civil Rights Act of 64 had many parts. The part that I was most involved with was Title VII. That is the title that created the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. The EEOC was created to look out for the rights of people in the field of employment. In 1969, we would send our investigators into the studios. We found a pattern of practice of discrimination. We referred to the Justice Department to do an investigation. Congress didn't take kindly to it. We've gotten to the point now where either this punitive harassment is gonna stop, or I'm going to the highest authority in this government get somebody fired. The Nixon administration was ready to put the ax to me I beat them by resigning. Dixon, not his way, he got this loudmouth black boy out. The whole issue of discrimination against women was hurt by the permissiveness of federal government allowing the movie industry to do what the hell it wanted to do. There's a direct connection between the number of women behind the scenes and the number of people of color behind the scenes and how that translates into gender and race biases on the big screen and little screen. We're sending really wrong messages, not only to girls, but to boys as well. Oh, that was beautiful. When my daughter was about two, I started watching little kid stuff with her. See, I'm thinking of becoming a doctor, Bert. Really? Mm -hmm. I immediately noticed there were far fewer characters that were female than male. Really? I was stunned. What are you shrieking about? Take it down a notch, my blues brothers. I realized girls are being seriously shortchanged. They're not doing half of the interesting or important things. May I get you absolutely anything in the world you could possibly want? They don't have occupations. He loves me. <laughs> I knew it! Or they're not there at all. We're saying that they are less valuable than men and boys. Why, hello, ladies. You ready to lose? Yeah. Hello, I like a bunch of little girls. We're teaching them that girls and women don't take up half of the space in the world. We're teaching boys that girls are less important. You wouldn't hit a woman. That's a woman. To see girls as second-class citizens. <laughs> we're like, oh, how come Congress isn't half women? CEOs and all this, how are we going to get more women on boards? Progress for women stalls out between like 15 and 20 percent in so many different sectors. Could it be that we're training people to see groups of people with only 17 percent women as normal?
Whenever I had a meeting in Hollywood, I'd say, have you ever noticed how few female characters there are in movies made for kids? Every single person said, oh, no, 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 that's not true anymore. That's been fixed. Nobody I talked to was seeing the problem that I was seeing. So that's when I decided, if I'm going to change this, I need the data. Gina commissioned one of the largest studies on children's media that had ever been done. It took two years. It was the first study of its kind. It's amazing that she went and did that homework and then served it all up, and then it's irrefutable evidence. The sort of data-driven case of this um, has really taken away that question of, is there a problem? You can't say, she's just being hysterical, or, God, she's just a bitch whining about this, if you have numbers. My scheme was to go to the people creating the media. I had no idea how they were going to react. She came when I was an executive at Disney and said in something like Finding Nemo, they're all fish, but most of them are men. He looks funny! Ow! It was a huge eye-opener, and nobody had pointed it out before. The work that she's done has had an enormous impact on me. Without further ado, please welcome our Commander-in-Chief, Gina Davis. There's one area of inequality that can be changed overnight and that's on screen. Data turns out to be the magic bullet. In this case, because the bias is unconscious. The first time that I saw the numbers, I have to say they were shocking. And I'm someone who knows that we're not doing a great job. Being passive on this issue is not good enough anymore. At the script stage, I go through and look, do I now have enough women? You have to actively get to the place where you put that as a part of your system. You have to instill the writing team, the producers, everybody with an awareness of it. The ratio of male to female characters in film has been exactly the same since 1946. We cannot wait around for change to happen when all the evidence shows us that we're going nowhere slowly. <laughs> we thought if we could invent software that could do the research for us, it would be a huge benefit. Gina Davis came to Google with a proposal to to automate this, this kind of analysis. One of our first goals was to discern screen and speaking time almost humanly impossible with the naked eye. If you see a green box, it means it's figuring out not only there's a face there, but it's a uh, female. We can actually quantify the amount of screen time, the amount of speaking time, and get data at that level. It takes maybe a, a minute to process one, one film. I am gonna share with you just quick slides of what we found. We have to be incredibly proactive. We have to realize this is not happening naturally on its own. I read a lot about Gina Davis Institute and finding out all the data regarding how bad the gender equality is in Hollywood. I was kind of shocked, and I also really wanted to do something to change it. We've been building up this amazing art house cinema in Stockholm together. We found out about the Bechtel Walls test. Och det är ett test som egentligen var en seriestrip från 1985 av Alison Bechtel. 
It's a very simple test to figure out how women are treated on screen. You need two named characters who are women. They need to have a conversation, and that conversation needs to be about something that is not a man. Säg åt det där, nästan om man berättar om det tycker jag. I just came back to my cinema and checked out how many of the films that I do program that pass it. When we did it, no film pass. And I was so embarrassed because you know you have this feeling that you're actually good in something, but then you, oh, you're not. We decided after one year of research to do a logo of the Bechtel Walls test. A simple logo with an A saying approved. I look for pleasure in the details. He's sweet, isn't he? Hey. Zip it, Sinead. The point of the Bechtel test for me was always that it was a joke. But if you actually investigate, you'll find that it's true. Half the movies fail it. It's films that are still coming out to this day. American Hustle, past. There's one conversation that's about nail polish. The top coat, it's like perfumey, but there's also something rotten. Uh, it's not perfect. My name is Shelly, and I'm here to be your house mother. One week after we launched a rates I had 80 interviews from the whole world. Even though I was so unprepared, I, of course, felt like I, I need to do this. So this is what Gina Davis say. If she can see it, she can be it. Girls and boys, until they are five years old, had the same kind of idea what they would like to do when they grow up. After five years old, it changed radically. And the reason is film and TV. Isn't he amazing? Aha! There was a study that showed now girls as young as six years old have learned to self-sexualize. This is Paisley as Julia Roberts in Pretty Woman. To view themselves through the male gaze at six years old. These are wet. Could you blow on them for me? I think that entertainment culture's promotion of the objectification of girls and women literally leads women to hate their bodies. When I was 16, I show up in my trailer for the first day of set. I'm getting dressed and I see my bra there and I'm like, oh, it's weird, it's a push-up bra. In front of the push-up bra, I saw two chicken cutlets. I had never seen a chicken cutlet, I didn't know. I was a kid, and I asked the wardrobe girl, and she's like, oh, uh, yeah, I was told to put these in your trailer. And one of the producers comes in, and I immediately was like, why is that here? He or she looked at me and said, it was a studio note. You're telling me that a group of people looked at a 16-year-old girl in the screen tests, and they said her breast didn't look big enough. It was the first time I really felt insecure. I looked at myself in the mirror and I was like, well, is it not right? That's when I started to realize, oh, I'm not just an actor. I'm viewed as an actress. A big part of why I wanted to change Hollywood was because if my little girl dreamed of being a storyteller in this world, I did not want the circumstances that kept me from being able to achieve success to keep her from being able to achieve success. That was not okay with me. What I really wanted to do was make sure that 
all girls didn't have to face that. It's one thing to say out loud, I want parody. It's another thing to then figure out day to day what the costs of that are, like what that actually means. Just by doing, you will achieve something that will push the limit. But be prepared that that's what you're starting. I joined the Directors Guild in 1999. I was called to an events meeting for the Women Steering Committee. And it was in those meetings that I discovered that it wasn't just me. Melanie Wager had this great idea for a summit to try to figure out how to get more work for women DGA members. She said, well, we've been trying to get it going for two years. It was not getting approved. That is a tiny little example of how obstructionist our own guild was in terms of us just trying to organize ourselves. It wasn't a, an officially sanctioned thing. We had to fight really hard to have it. It was a way of shining a light and, 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 and putting a mirror to them. And I don't think they wanted to see what was there. I was invited to sit on a panel and here were these powerful women. I was surprised at how powerless they felt. Our purpose as organizers was also to create a list of women director members of the Directors Guild. At the end of the afternoon, an executive at the DGA said, could I please take your list and bring it upstairs and copy it? We never got it back. They said, we've determined that this is our property. That's unconscionable. That's gagging. That's red flagging. Instinctively, I knew that something was fundamentally really wrong on a legal level, not just on a moral, ethical level. And then somebody mentioned to me that there had already been a legal action in the 1980s by the group of six female directors. The first time the six women of the DGA got together was in 78, 79, and was actually an event run by, I think, my memory says, women in film. Hi, nice to meet you, what do you do? <laughs> I'm an out-of-work director. It was really a tough conversation because in the entertainment industry, the last thing you want to do is say, I'm not working. Are you working? No. Are you working? No. None of us were working. It was preposterous. It was preposterous. These were accomplished women. We had one Oscar, a Fulbright, two AFI filmmaker grants, two Emmys, and what we figured out we really needed was a penis. I remember getting up and saying, we are all doomed to stunted careers if we don't do something. We needed to find out why. One of the amazing resources we had was the Academy of Motion Pictures Arts and Sciences Library. Nell Cox and I were there, weeks on end, pulling magazines. We studied a period between 1949 and 1979 with little pencil and paper chit sheets, looking for the number of films per year and looking for women's names. We started going back into DGA records, which they were reluctant to fork over. We met almost every Saturday for a year. We worked very, very hard at covering all the bases. What we came up with was this astonishing statistic that between 1949 and 1979, one half of 1% 1 of all assignments went to women. It's like, do you have a plate of cookies? There were 100 cookies on the plate. All the guys come and they take 99 and a half cookies. And all the women directors in the guild 
have to fight over that one half of a cookie. We've all had our eyes opened. And once opened, you realize how shut they were. We went to the Director's Guild to try to get them to do something about it. Did the, the men understand there was discrimination in the entertainment industry? Not really. <laughs> There's a lot of resistance. All of a sudden, we were holding up a mirror to husbands and fathers, and we were saying, you want this for your daughter? Maybe your daughters want to be directors. Mel Brooks was on the national board. He was the loose cannon. You never knew what Mel Brooks was going to come up with. He got up from his seat. That was like the first, uh-oh, uh-oh, what is he going to do? And he leaned on the table, and he said, you guys are nitpicking and pettifogging the women into the shithouse. He started yelling, this is their time, this is their time. The Directors Guild chose to have voluntary cooperation, voluntary compliance. Things like learn to be a better director classes, coaching, oh, and to observe the director at a show. I can't tell you how many of our women director members observed, 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 observed. By the time all this voluntary compliance was another year, year and a half, by then we had the proof that it was just smoke and mirrors. Executive Director Mike Franklin called a big giant meeting to review. And he invited all the same people and nobody showed up. Nobody from the studios, networks, production companies came up at all. This is the first time those men were ever treated with a slap in the face. They were treated like a woman and it was their first taste of it. Well, Michael Franklin got angry and he said, we're suing them. Law is very important to making change. You can't change hearts and minds, but there can be consequences. And laws establish consequences for behavior, and I think that's very important. There has never been in any union that filed a lawsuit against any studio, any network, about an issue such as equal hiring equity. We came to the conclusion that voluntary compliance was ridiculous. People are not going to take jobs away from people they've hired. Title VII is the law of the land. But unless there are specific mandates, compliance is fluid. We were assigned to the federal court of Judge Pamela Reimer. We thought, oh, well, a woman judge. Maybe she'll understand what it's like to be shut out. She threw the case out. It's like the wind is knocked out of you. She said the Guild was not a proper litigant because members of the Guild discriminate themselves. Directors discriminate when they don't hire women and minority assistant directors. Assistant directors discriminate when they don't hire second assistant directors who are women and minorities. It was a legitimate turndown. We weren't prepared for it, and I was surprised by that. I discovered this community four years ago when I began an anthropological study of aging in an ethnic group. I want to get good at what I care about doing. And that's what we've been deprived of. And the award goes to Number Our Days, Lynn Lickman. Misogyny is an invisible sport.
It prevented us from creating careers. It prevented us from creating bodies of work. If we had won the case, it would have been a mandate. You have to hire a certain number of women or you're breaking federal law. Film industry dodged a bullet. They got away with it. It was a terrible loss. So much effort by these women directors, but you really saw an incredibly radical shift among female director hires in Hollywood because of a legal action. In the following 10 years, the numbers skyrocketed to 16%. But then, after 1995, no more progress. For the next 20 years, the number of women directors was going to go in decline. And women of color, off the map. I realized that we were not going to be able to solve this problem from within. We had to get this out of the DGA and into the world. The most obvious solution that we could come up with was to take this to the ACLU. The American Civil Liberties Union works to protect people's constitutional rights and defend the Bill of Rights that, that's guaranteed to everyone in the United States. Watchdog groups like the ACLU, all they're asking is that the law be respected. We don't so much need to change the laws as enforce the laws. My friends were reluctant to go outside the industry. They were worried. The film business is a who you know business. You cannot go out there and start yelling because you'll never get hired again. Maria Geis is very brave. She's on the front line taking the hits, you know, and not making a lot of friends, I suppose. The whole thing is about fear. And the one thing you cannot do if you're trying to make change is respond to fear. She has the passion and the energy that I remember. I was full time on this. For me to be able to get the point across to the ACLU, it was essential to be able to define this as a national problem, a global problem, a civil rights problem. Hollywood is our storytelling machine. I've been appointed to defend Tom Robinson. It creates, in large part, our cultural narrative and informs the voice of our very civilization. These three words written larger than the rest. We the people. They must apply to everyone or they mean nothing. We American people rely on our entertainment industry largely for it to communicate our stories. All right, let's go to work. And to represent us to each other and to the rest of the world. That's correct. And women's creative input is not making it into our nation's storytelling, into our cultural narrative. Maria reached out to Melissa Goodman because of Melissa's expertise is in gender issues. There are federal laws that very clearly and specifically prohibit sex discrimination in employment. California has their own set of very strong and protective gender discrimination laws as well. Over the course of the next six weeks, I met in their offices and I told my story. If there are nearly zero members of a protected group in a workplace, something is keeping them out. I think if you were Starbucks and 93% of your employees were male, that would be a problem. Unless it can be justified as necessary to the functioning of these companies, it's illegal under Title VII. That's the story that I think gets us places. We strongly believe, and the data strongly suggests, that bias behind the camera in Hollywood 
is directly related to all the other discrimination and bias that we fight at the ACLU in, in all other facets of life. It's all connected. Over the next several months, um, my colleagues gathered stories from around 50 women. I had been in conversation with the ACLU and was letting them know about some of my experiences. In an industry like film and television, or the process for hiring, is a spider web. All of these organizations play a different role in navigating the process for making film and making television. The networks blame the showrunners. The showrunners blame the agencies in the studios. The studios are blaming the showrunners in the networks. So they all have a safe zone in which they can say, I'm not racist or sexist. What it results in is a wild irrationality in who gets to make TV and movies. People would say, the biggest problem is women never make it on agency lists to the studios. You call all the major agencies and say, we need 12 directors for this, this order, and who do you have? Most of them are men. If the list that we get are all men in the list, we are overloaded with a lot of work, and sometimes we don't look beyond our lists. When I reached out to agencies, to send me other writers, they said, we don't have any. And someone actually said, I understand, you're covering your ass for some reason. We're going to send you some more white men. They actually said white men. Yes. If a woman is paid less than a man, an agent is going to make more money pushing a male writer or a male director. Starting out as an agent, I was encouraged to spend most of my time representing male clients, because it was the view that male clients made more money. If you can't get in the door to be even on the list of people considered, you're clearly never going to get a job. The movies that we make are huge. And we don't want to have people making these movies and fail. So you want to make sure that they have some sort of experience to get it done. It's hard to say, well, this woman who made a $5 million horror movie, let's give her a $150 million action movie. Well, it, you have to let people do it so that they have experience to change the pool. None of our directors before they came to us had made a $100 million movie. None of our male directors. The idea that we have a lack of qualified women all of that is bullshit. We have a lack of people who are comfortable hiring people who exist outside of their comfort zone. There's plenty of us. You could hire women for every feature film in this, in this country, and you would not run out of women to hire. Our job is to help and demand that studios and producers and networks and streamers make decisions that favor gender equality. You just hire women. It's not that hard. It's not that hard. I have not had a hard time doing it, so I don't understand why that's difficult. We came to the conclusion that it was a really serious civil rights problem that deserved the attention of the EEOC, which is the agency tasked with enforcing Title VII. When I saw that letter, I was shocked. It was like, Wow, that's incredible. On October 6th, I received one of the first letters from the EEOC asking to interview me. This meant the investigation was on. The EEOC says they're going to investigate Hollywood. This is a massive accomplishment for us. I went down to the EEOC and did, I believe it was about four hours worth of interviews, and so did many other people, too. In terms of outcomes, the EEOC is always focused on a variety of remedies. 
That could range from instituting certain percentages of women considered and hired for jobs. They can impose the reporting requirements. Here are the number of women we considered. Here are the number of women we hired. Here's why. I would hope it would be a wake-up call. You know, we're all of us doing something really wrong, and it's time. Every form of pressure is important. If it comes from a need to settle a lawsuit, it will happen faster than if it comes from, gee, this is something we should do, but we don't have to do it. I think the EEOC thing is great because either you gotta shame people legally <laughs> and say we're gonna, you may get sued if you don't do this, or you just have to shame them publicly and go like, hey everybody, look, look what they haven't been doing, this is ridiculous. As it stands right now, if you are a person with hiring power and you are not actively, actively trying to hire more women, you are part of the problem. I'll be interested in seeing in this very documentary how many men in positions of power will sit here and explain why they don't hire women. It's an easy question. At the same time I started noticing the scripts were really bad for women in Hollywood, I decided I was going to go on a tour of all the studios and meet with every studio head and say, like, what are you, what are you developing for me, for other women? And they literally looked at me blank, like they had nothing. One studio said, we think we might have one movie where we can flip the gender from a guy to a woman. And I thought, huh, what? This is crazy. I felt like I could either admire that problem or do something about it. You sound like a feminist. I am. That's excellent. It's fantastic. I love feminists. So I put up my own money, and I had two employees, and just started developing these projects with Bonnie. smart, articulate, capable women. It's actually no. kind of annoying that you look like that, and you're smart. Reason has a very vital production company, and they're creating female-centric stories that are really successful. Big Little Lies. It's time for our business to wake up and realize that it's good economics as well as the right thing to do. People in senior leadership can really change an organization. Having a specific plan in their talent strategy about diversity and inclusion and being very persistent to make sure that you're getting access to the best pool of talent that you can. When I was president of entertainment at ABC, it was just after Sex and the City was announced to be going away. Stop. Really, you're going to make me cry. That became a real trigger. We need to find the next show for women. I may be dead, but I'm still pretty. I would watch TV, and the women on network television all felt cute. <gasps> Sexy. I'm cute. It's so girly and stupid. They all felt like somebody's fantasy of what a woman would be. God, look at her. I was like, I don't really want to watch these shows. What I wanted to watch was a show about competitive women who love their jobs, who are happy to stand up to the guys and be big dogs. We were rolling some ideas around, and the idea of doing a medical show came up. And so we started talking about what a medical show would look like if it was coming from Shonda's brain. She wrote Grey's Anatomy. The way that she wanted to do it with the diversity of the cast and the diversity of the points of view, it was totally unique. Betsy and I were brought into a room full of older white men. Pilot screenings were dominantly male. This one gentleman said, the pilot is appalling. You have this woman who the night before her first day in her new job goes out, gets drunk, picks up a guy, sleeps with him, and then goes into work. I mean, who would ever do that? And I remember looking at him and saying, well, actually, I did it. It was fascinating watching them trying to shape Meredith Grey into one of their sort of fantasy girls who's perfect and wholesome. We just didn't do it. Dr. Grey, you need to tell us what you want to do. 
all the parts that I had been auditioning for or with a girlfriend or the wife. So I did notice immediately that, oh, I get to be the lead role. I get to be a doctor. I get to have opinions. I get to be smart. Shonda was able to make half of her cast not white. Everyone, listen up, please. I was very lucky because Grey's Anatomy was developed under the network presidency of Susan Lyne. She had to fight really hard to get them to put it on the air. When I called to say we were going to green light it, the male executive on the other end of the line literally hung up on me. Because of the show's success, what Shonda has done with that power has been remarkable. Moments like this give every woman an opportunity to decide what kind of person she wants to be. She created Scandal, where the lead character is African-American woman. Later on, she was also able to hire an African-American lead actress who is older and who has darker skin. These are all building blocks to being able to show ourselves fully. When you have diverse creators making diverse content, you get representations of experience that you never would have gotten otherwise. That scene with Viola Davis taking off her wig was revolutionary. We often, as black women, have to put on this armor when we enter the world. It was like she took the weight off of our shoulders in public. That moment represented black women coming out of these shadows of, I have to look like this. Shonda Rhimes is the most powerful showrunner in Hollywood. People look at her and say, isn't the problem solved? I was following the EEOC case very closely. The women who brought that suit and who documented all those exclusions and abuses are heroic. I began digging around and I wanted to see what I could find out about directors in the world of TV. All the data was there, but it wasn't all that easy to see the numbers by network. I don't like math, but even a non-math person like me can add up a row of zeros. I constructed a chart for every network, and there are four categories, white men, white women, men of color, women of color. And the network with the worst track record was FX. I was very disappointed. I thought of myself as an enlightened person. I would have described myself as a feminist. So I started to inquire much more deeply into the kinds of unique challenges faced by women, uh, by African Americans, by people who are not gender normative. We've got to put our finger on the scale and try to do something to change this situation. People will hire the same type of people every time if you don't have that meeting to tell them not to. I wrote a letter to all the showrunners of our shows, asking them to help us do better, but also telling them that we would provide them with all the resources necessary to make that successful. In July, their staff approached me and said, we've gone from 89% white men directing our shows to 49%. And I just said, no, you didn't. I had this unconscious bias that we would have to be making sacrifices to hire people with less experience. They don't care that I'm black. And maybe that the talent wouldn't I be just there. I think that they just don't like me. Oh, 
they care plenty. And I'm here to say it's there. There's nothing funny here! And the minute we open our door and we say, come express it here... Welcome. ...the work got better. Hello, Daddy. Feud is so, so good. You directed an episode of it. I did. It'll be on. Right. It's one of the best things that's ever happened in my professional career. Anyone who then told me or told any other journalist in the future, it's too hard? No, it's not. Look at what FX did. It can only be done if the CEO is totally invested in this. It doesn't work if it's just lip service. Progress will happen when men take a stand. It's the chivalry of the 21st century. I'm doing a better job for having changed the way I think about this. I'm doing a better job of funneling the most talented people into this business. And I think that makes people uncomfortable. I've been increasingly open as I've gotten older to seeing my white male heterosexual identity as an unearned advantage in the world. I think it's difficult sometimes for men to see that because I think they feel like it diminishes the nature of their, um, of their achievement or their life. But I just think it's a fact. When you try to move from where we are towards something which looks more nearly like equality, there are people who are doing quite nicely now who feel like something is being taken away from them. I have a friend. He came back from a job interview that hadn't particularly gone well, and we were having coffee. And he said, you know, uh, all they're looking for is black women. And I said, did they tell you that? And he said, no, but everybody knows that. And, I, and then I didn't know what to do. I didn't know whether I should get up and leave the table, whether I should pull the statistics up on my telephone, but it's simply not true. We're hearing a lot of people saying, when we factor in gender, we're not selecting for excellence. And I find that it's the other way around. We are factoring in gender, the male gender, and that is what is constraining the selection of excellence. The countervailing forces against change must be enormous. They're enormous, they're powerful, and they're silent. As women, we are not allowed to be angry. Our anger is not, not appropriate. I can point to the change. I can point to when the forest went up in fire. I moved on her like a bitch, <laughs> and she was married. She's a disgusting pig, right? When you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Grab them by the pussy. The Fox has called the 45th president of the United States. It is truly, unequivocally, a breaking point for women. Oh, my God. This was the gasoline on the spark that awakened the country. In the last couple of decades, a majority of women felt that there was nothing more to fight for. Now we see that there is a lot to fight for. Shut up and smile. Don't spread. Oh, my God. People didn't just get discouraged and say, wow, that sucks. Right there on Inauguration Day going, we're here and we're not going away. But no one knows me, no one ever will. I don't say something if I just lie still. Would I be a monster to scare them? Older women that have been through these battles 
are gratified to see it revived. And it feels right. I can't keep quiet. No, no, no. I can't keep quiet. I want to thank our new president. You just started the revolution. Women's rights are human rights. Women's rights are human rights. All of a sudden, the dam broke open. I could never have envisioned something that would change the world. I was trying to change my community. New York Times reporting. A growing community of women speaking out. Harvey Weinstein sexually harassed. Including Rose McGowan and Ashley Judd. Hollywood has built itself on that casting couch thing and on keeping people silent. When it's one, you can say she's crazy and ruin her career. And when it's 100, it's undeniable. Guilty, guilty, guilty! Sexual harassment and abuse are a symptom of employment discrimination. They expose the way that business works in Hollywood. The Me Too movement is morphing into Time's Up. The movement has raised over $16 million to help victims of workplace harassment. It's action, and that was what really pulled me in. We have to create momentum based on this moment. You can't just say, well, we won't sexually harass the women, but we're not going to give them bigger roles and more to say and more important things to do. In order for true systemic change to happen, it has to be inclusive. Everyone has to come along with it. And change needs to happen immediately. We need more female content. We need more female filmmakers and better roles for actresses. And at a certain point, some people have to take some risks or everything just sort of stays the same, right? This is no man's land, Diana. This is not something you can cross. It's a moment of confidence and decision of what you can do. It's, it's not about the wall of people that you're going up against. She's just going to go across and be the one that makes a difference. We, as consumers, lose sight of the power that we do have. Things are going to change. It's your daughters, it's your granddaughters, it's your children, it's your stories. It's your job. If I could go back and talk to my teenage self, I would say, actually, you'll learn a feminist is exactly what you want to be. And people will come to realize that what's good for women is, is good for everybody. Stuck in a ride, only because you're clipping my wings, holding me down. 
Catching me in, locking me out. Scared of the tears, sweating the blood. Standing on me to hold yourself up. Only a few feet off the ground. But why? Saying my place, but that's why I am. 